and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Amen, everybody. This is Brother Frank back with a, another episode of The Remnant Call, and I'm just glad to be here with you. This is going to be part three of our Deeper Communion series with uh, Brother David Murray, and uh, tonight he is going to speak about judgments and uh, about judging. And, you know, I just had a little something that I wanted to share with everybody. It's a little poem that, that I'd like to just to just as before we bring him on, I just want to share it with you. It goes like this. I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp, the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How do all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Hey, Lord, give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock at the thought of seeing you. I share that with you tonight because we need to be very careful on who we decide that can and can't be in God's kingdom. And folks, God, I am telling you right now, is a specialist at saving the unsavable. Those whose society says is of no value, well, that just happened to be the ones he chose to share his everlasting gospel to at the time here on this earth. The Bible referred to them as unlearned men. When the Pharisees saw them, they basically were saying, who are these idiots that you're here with? Well, God took some idiots, and thank God for that, because I feel like one, and he turned the world upside down. What do you think he can do with a willing heart and an able mind and someone that's just willing to try things that maybe they've never done before, I'll tell you what God can do. He can save rotten sinners just like you and me. Well, I'm not going to keep this any longer. I'm going to bring on our guest tonight. He's all the way from the great state of New York, and that is my good friend, Brother David Murray. David, are you here with us tonight? I am, Frank. How are you doing, brother? I am. I'm doing well, brother. I'm glad to have you on. I'm glad to have you on. You know, I love sharing that poem because it's a reminder to me. Don't ever put anything past God when it comes to salvation. Nobody's beyond well, his reach. Frank, it, 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 it is just so funny because we were talking just for a moment before we got on the air, and that poem really sums up um, – tonight's uh, teaching and, and tuition in the word of God. Uh, and that is, you know, how to judge from father's heart or said another way, how to make righteous judgments. And so you were going to be talking about a lot of that tonight. So that is just so funny that you shared that poem, which I had no idea you're going to, because that goes dovetails perfectly as a prelude into what we're going to be talking about tonight. Amen. Well, praise God. David, I'm going to ask, um, would you mind opening up the show with a word of prayer and just asking, Uh, the Heavenly Father, just to be present in our midst through this show and to guide in His will through the whole thing. You bet. Heavenly Father, we come before You and we thank You for the honor and the privilege and the blessing of being able to share and teach and encourage and instruct one another in a land where we can still do that openly and freely. Father, I thank you that this message would pierce all our hearts. Lord, your word says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
for those that have received Amen. the gift of righteousness. There's no condemnation. Amen. And so, Father, as we make course adjustments, Lord, I thank you that the accuser of the brethren is struck down in our thinking by the power of the Holy Spirit to rightly divide, to begin to teach us what comes from you will always motivate to greater intimacy and what comes from the devil always attempts to alienate. Father, I thank you for your words just bringing light and life, spirit, soul, and body. Bless the airways in the name of Jesus Christ this time for this channel and the work that you're doing in the body of Christ and through Brother Frank in this hour. Thank you for this night. This teaching would go forth. Anything not of you would just fall to the ground. What is of you, Lord God, would take root and provide seeds of righteousness for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, David, for being here with us tonight. And I want to just say, I want to thank God. David, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before, but really our interaction, um, you know, since we've gotten to know each other um, and outside of the radio show and my initial listening to you has not just been a blessing for me, but the things that you have laid on my heart and I've been able to share with some of my friends too, that it, David's like, you've helped me unlock what I've always known in some aspects, but I've never been able to embrace fully to its fullest part. I mean, you've helped me to understand that, you know, the things that I, that were down in my heart can fully be trusted. And, and it really came from the inability to shake off traditions from how I was raised as a child. And I find that, you know, so difficult for so many people to actually begin to live in the power of forgiveness and the power of being redeemed and the power of his resurrection and all those things, instead of living in the condemnation of trying to live up to something that nobody can ever obtain, all oh, holiness is much easier when you simply walk in the promises that he's given. And I just want to say thank God for that, David. It's, it's a game changer. It's truly a game changer for me. Amen, Frank. Thank you. Just thank you for the blessing and the honor of sharing your heart. And, um, man, it, it chokes me up every time because um, when I was about 20 and the Lord first got a hold of me and, and I was crying out to him, you know, I received him when I was about seven and, and when I was 20, I was crying out to him saying, there's got to be more to this Christian life, and I'm just missing it. I'm doing everything perfect in my own eyes according to my interpretation of you and who I believe you are. And I remember the Lord just stopped me one day. It was on my 20th birthday, and he said, David, you need to find out who I am. And um, after you find that out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pass you through a lot of rejection and a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. But if you allow me to use it to transform you, um, you know, my desire will be to pass that on to the rest of the body of Christ. And, um, and, and so it is absolutely my honor and, and joy to hear that some of the suffering and the pain that he walked me through to break me free of some things. And he's still got me his hands full. You know, I'm still a work in progress. But to be able to hear that, that the body of Christ is being sharpened by one another, uh, just as you sharpen me, Frank, and how, you know, we talk about our friendship and, and the blessing it's been to me and the encouragement and the, the, the motivation it's been to me, how we're all meant to do that in the body of Christ. And, and none of us are meant to be spectators. So thank you, Frank. That's an, it's such a blessing and honor and it encourages me not to grow weary and get discouraged, which sometimes I'm prone to. So thank you. Amen. God bless. You know, I just want to, uh, say, David, that, you know, a lot of times it's the hardest thing you, you do stuff and you wonder, is anybody actually listening? And I think we're going to find out, you know, when it's all over and done, the lives that were touched that you never even saw that were touched. And, and I believe that's the power of what God does um, is he touches people sometimes. And we don't see, I, I, I guess if we saw so much, we might we could get puffed up, you know, but. But um, you'd be surprised sometimes at the simplest things that when the Spirit of God is behind it penetrates so, so deeply. I had no idea that one out of how many times I've mowed my grass, one day was going to be different than every other mowing. 
And that was the day uh, yeah. David Murray spoke a message that just tore me up and God broke through and really, really got a hold of me that day. So God bless you, brother. Uh, lead us into where the Lord has taken you. Today. Yeah, so uh, in, in continuing on with our Deeper Communion series, um, I was asking the Lord, you know, what, what are the next things in the building blocks? There's so many things we can talk about that, that point us to greater intimacy, and that really should be everything. If we read and look at everything in the Word of God, Frank, you know, everything is meant to point us to, toward intimacy. The Bible is either looked, seen as one or two ways. It's either seen as a, uh, a diary, a love letter to his creation, or it's seen as a rule book. And one of the things that the Lord is breaking today um, and inviting the body of Christ is to begin to begin to pick up his heart and begin to use the word of God, not as a rule book, because the rules have been, have been fulfilled in Christ. Uh, the, the rule is that we are unrighteous. The rule is that we are bound for hell because of the sin of one man, Adam. But that Jesus came and paid for the penalty of that sin. All wrath was poured out on the cross. And so the only law that's left is the law of love. And the problem is, is that we don't want to look a lot of times at the law of love because we, it's in order for us, brothers and sisters, to accept the law of love as the covenant we live in, as, as the, the greatest of everything, right? Faith, hope, and love, of everything that the kingdom is summed up in love. In order for us to embrace that, we first have to embrace that there's nothing we can do to add to our self-worth. Because wherever we reject love, if we look at the motive of our heart, and the motive of our heart is what's going to determine how we can understand or the depth that we distort anything Father speaks to us on, the depth of that distortion will be the depth that we either accept or reject. We are fully pleasing and unconditionally loved by Father God. That's what the cross did for us. Colossians 121, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 17, 1 Corinthians 6, 1. I'm, I'm saying them fast because you have time to look them up yourselves, guys, because we you know, want to try to keep this short and to the point and, and give some meat to the word. It's time for the meat of the word in the body of Christ. And what that has to do with judgment is, is we, we need to break down what it means to, you know, we live in a time where social media and the different media platforms in which so many people have the, the blessing to share with the body of Christ, we hear a lot of talk about judgments, but there's not a lot of teaching on judgments. There's a lot, of, a lot of talk on wrath, but there's not a talk on understanding what the word judgment is. You know, if we even say, well, what is the word you know, judgment? We say, well, what's love? Well, that's the Greek word agape, right? We know that. Or well, what's righteousness mean? You read righteousness. Or sanctification. Oh, well, that's the Greek word, hagi, you know, hagioi or hagioi. It really means to be declared holy and in the same nature of God. Right? But when we say, well, what does judgment mean? I don't know. Well, how does that pertain to the kingdom? Well, you know, I don't know. God's kind of, you know, he's angry and, and he's going to start judging because he's angry. <laughs> no, not really. So we really need to break this down. We're going to break this down over the next um, few times that, um, Lord willing, I'm able to come on. It's like, guys, what we're going to talk about is the biblical judgment. What is it to mean to have a biblical judgment? And the context is going to be Matthew 7, 1 and John 7, 24, when Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged. That's Matthew 7. But then later on, John records Jesus saying, do not judge according to appearance, but make a righteous judgment. So since we know God is not schizophrenic, and we've, we've talked about that before, uh, we know that there's there's – there's more to this judgment than really we're, we're being taught on. In a lot of hey, circles. David, sometimes it's like you're moving a little bit away from your mic just a little bit. Let's see if I can get so, it closer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate That's that. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So what is the difference between when Jesus says, don't judge, and then in other set places he says, when you do judge, make a righteous judgment. So we're going to talk about that. So tonight we're going to talk about how to make a righteous judgment. What are righteous judgments? How do we judge according to Father's heart? You know, and then after that, we're going to begin getting into how to judge ourselves. The scriptures say to judge ourselves. And then after that, we can begin to talk more about the God side of things. What are the different judgments that are in the kingdom? What are the different judgments that, that flow from his throne room, which is really his heart? 
know, a lot of people think, well, there's just one judgment that's coming. There's not. There's, there's many judgments in the world. There's many judgments that flow from the kingdom of heaven. Some of them have already taken place. Some of them are, are, are judgments that haven't yet come. And uh, we need to, the more that we can rightly divide the word of God, the more that we can begin to understand his kingdom, his nature, and we can cooperate with it, things become less confusing. But guys, I can't stress enough. That must start from having a proper understanding of who you are as a redeemed child of God. In any area where our thinking is not in agreement with who he says he made us through the blood of Christ, through the torture of the atonement, we break intimacy. We break communion in that area of our thinking because the Bible says we commune, we worship in spirit and in truth. And where our soul is believing lies, there's no truth. And when we're moving, moving by the lies that we believe, we're not moving by spirit. So let's dig into this. You know, when we talk about the different judgments, um, everything in the kingdom, guys, we'll talk about more of this another time, but everything in the kingdom has two parts to the covenant. There's a God side and there's a man side. Any covenant is cut between two individuals. There's two aspects of a covenant. That's what, by definition, a covenant is. It's an exchange of something. Judgment is no different. God cut covenants throughout the history of man that started with Adam and Eve before they sinned, after they sinned, and it culminated in Christ. And so an example of the different judgments would be the God side, understanding the God side, which we're going to get into down the road is going to understand the judgments. That's, that's a God side teaching. What does God have to do with the covenant? Mm-hmm. So let, we have to first understand the different um, judgments. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about what is man's side to the judgment, meaning what is our responsibility in order to move in agreement with the Lord? And if I, if Frank, if I apologize if I have a little bit of audio problems. I'm really not moving at all. No, no, so it's a, you're doing okay now. You're, you're, you're okay. doing okay, David. That uh, that text okay. you got from me was from like 10 minutes ago. So go ahead, brother. Okay. <laughs> Glenn, I'm punctual in replying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so guys, what we're going to talk about, when we talk about the man side of kingdom judgments, what does this even mean? Um, well, let's start with the word judgment that's described in the new covenant. They're not old covenant beings. We have cut a new covenant that was accomplished once the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The new covenant is righteousness through Christ. Holy Spirit lives in us. That's the new covenant. So in the Greek and the New Testament, the word for judgment is krino. It means to properly separate, to distinguish, to discern, to come to a choice. Did you guys catch that? Let's say that again. To separate, distinguish, to come to a choice. There's no wrath in that word. There's no anger in that word. It's a legal proceeding. It's a judicious declaration. The word judge means to thoroughly separate. Guys, when we're judging something, what we are meant to do is divide between that which is of our Heavenly Father's kingdom and that which is not. Here's the key, guys. Biblical judgment is to judge actions. Remember when Jesus said in John seven twenty four, do not judge according to peer appearance, but make a righteous judgment. Jesus is telling us there is a righteous and an unrighteous way to make a judgment. See, in Matthew 7, 1, where Jesus says, do not judge, you'll be judged. He's talking about emotionally passing condemnation on somebody. He's talking about judging or separating according to someone's 
um, according to the emotions of how we look at things. Don't pass a judgment on people. Anger, wrath, unforgiveness, self-righteousness. But in John 7, 24, he's talking about making a right, righteous judgment. He's talking about rightly dividing that which is of the kingdom and Father's nature and that which is not. This is the proper way, guys, that we judge according to the new covenant. We judge the thoughts, the item, or the action against the nature of God. And I'll repeat that again, guys. In the new covenant, when we are told to judge, when we are commanded to judge in portions of Scripture, we're to judge the thought, the item, or the action against the nature of God, against the truth of Christ. We are not called to emotionally pass condemnation on people. We judge actions. God says we've been made the righteousness of Christ. There's no accusation that can stand against us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, which I said earlier on, I'm going to read it now. It says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Guys, everything we do is to be judged against this new nature and the gifts that was given to the world. The world was offered this gift. When we discern what is of God's kingdom and is not, this is what John 7, 24, Jesus is referring to by making a righteous judgment or judging by righteousness. Now, guys, here's the key. What is the purpose of judging? This will help us to separate whether we are making righteous or unrighteous judgments. The purpose of judging sin is love. There's no love in judging a person. That's condemnation. That's to declare someone unworthy because of their actions. Jesus said, I have made you holy and blameless and above reproach because of what I did on the cross. That's why we're not to judge people. We judge actions because where we can rightly divide actions that separate us from intimacy, it brings us into greater communion. That is an expression of love. I I can't tell you how many times that I have been asked, well, how would you counsel on this and how would you counsel on that? Uh, My spouse, uh, my children, my relatives, my neighbor. Guys, if we understood proper biblical judgment, it would become very clear. To judge means to separate truth from lies, God's kingdom from Satan's kingdom, in order to increase intimacy and increase the expression and the exchange of love. The purpose of judging anything is reconciliation and love. I'll give you some scriptures, some examples. And Paul's talking in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. This is Paul talking about corporate um, discipline or judgment right, within the body of Christ. So we usually stop there and we, and we like to quote that because it makes us feel good. I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing, right? And we usually recite that with anger, with self-righteousness, with wrath. We grit our teeth. But let's keep reading, guys. For I indeed, as absent in the body but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. Guys, let's, let's keep going in context. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And here's the end part, guys. What is the purpose of all this? That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What was the end motive of that? Was it anger and wrath, an excuse to hurt someone or or to vent our own pain? No. No, the purpose is reconciliation. The purpose was salvation. The purpose was making sure that person didn't backslide to the point where they would alienate themselves from the Lord. Because the scriptures say, whom God has received, he will never turn away. He will never leave us or forsake us. When we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot disown himself. But we can choose if we want to reject him. 
Paul is saying, guys, when you come together, you, you, for a season in time, you must remove this person from the fellowship so they feel the pang of the loss of the blessing that they have so that they can begin understanding what they're missing and the pain of that separation, the pain of that break in spiritual intimacy will cause him to repent and it will guard him from the destruction that could take place and the buffeting of Satan. That's love, guys. That's love. And today, we, our sense of corporate fellowship, to whatever degree we have it, is modeled much differently. When we come together, a lot of times it's, 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 um, there's not a lot of social interaction. And for even those of us, some of us that don't have the blessing of regular fellowship, right, uh, we don't have that. We're in the first century. The fellowship of the believers, of the redeemed, they moved with such power and intimacy and love that the thought of having to be temporarily removed from that was anguishing. Now someone said, oh, you throw me out. I don't care. Well, what do I care? I don't really like you guys anyway. <laughs> it's much different today. Because for a lot of us, we've lost sight of who we truly are in Christ. And to the degree that we don't understand that, there's not a lot of exchange of love. So that's one example. The purpose of judgment is restoration and love. I'm going to give you a second one. Corinthians 11.31, Paul again speaking to the, to the believers gathered at the city of Corinth. But if we are judged ourselves, truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. What is the motive of us judging ourselves there? What is the motive of Paul sharing, hey, guys, judge yourselves so that you don't have to be judged. But if you are judged, if you are disciplined, it's so that you won't be condemned. Guys, what's the purpose? Love, intimacy, reconciliation. Now, we're not going to get into this too much tonight, but here we talk about judging. Guys, this is talking about born-again, spirit-filled believers. This is not a judgment talking about heaven and hell. Remember, the word judgment, this word here is krino. The word Korean, the Greek word, 20 Strong's 2919, means to separate. When God disciplines us, it is love. It's to separate the sin in our life that robs us of the opportunity of greater intimacy. Guys, I know for many of us that is absolutely groundbreaking because we are not teaching on that. We went from the hell and fire and brimstone of the 50s to the free love in the 60s to self-centered message in the 80s, to where we're back now under a neo-modern form of fire and brimstone. We just packaged it differently. So much of the body of Christ that's outside of, of, of certain circles, we just talk about judgment, and we're living in fear. I, I, I listened to a wonderful um, teaching today, and in the comments, uh, one person wrote, you know, we just need to pray that we are counted worthy when the Lord comes. Guys, that broke my heart. I wept and prayed for that person for an hour. And for the people that read that and the people that are listening and for the rest of the body of Christ that would be thinking that. Guys, we've been counted worthy the second we received the gift of righteousness. You can't gain and lose your righteousness. Salvation is a byproduct of Jesus making us holy. We can't say we are born again and yet reject righteousness because that is what Jesus gave us at the cross. As we begin to understand that everything that God does flows from love, we talked about his nature is love expressed different ways. To discipline or to judge, to separate the things that bind us up and prevent us from moving in freedom in Christ. Because remember, he died for intimacy, guys. And he's not schizophrenic. He's not loving us so much that, he, that Jesus would be willing to be tortured. The Father loves us so much, he's willing to send his son. And then the next moment, now once we receive the gift, now he's angry with us. Guys, this is a false gospel. God hates sin. But we have been redeemed. And for the world that hasn't yet received that gift, the Bible says, yet we were, when we were sinners, enemies with God because of our wicked behavior. 
yet he died for us. So that's the litmus test, guys. And rounding this out, the litmus test, when we're looking at a person, whether they're lost or whether they're a Christian struggling, we look at a nation, our leaders, or ourselves. Are we judging them personally? Are we asking the Lord, what is on your heart for them, Father? Are we asking the Lord, what's motivating my heart? What is the root emotion, guys, of where our thoughts come from? For many of us, it's old and it's rooted in lies. The lies being that my self-worth comes from how well I perform, and I judge others by that same lie. If we have been taught one way or another, we have been modeled that our value comes from our performance, we are going to judge others by that same measuring rod. And guys, that has been broken at the cross. What is left is intimacy. Sin separates us from the intimacy we have with God. Sin is a violation of the nature of God. It is, by definition, everything that opposes the nature of God. That's why we can come before the throne of God boldly. Because when he sees us, he sees us clothed in righteousness. How we choose to live and think is our choice. We can continue to live as if we're covered in filthy rags, or we can choose to accept what he says. And when we see others, we have the choice to judge them according to the law of love or we have the choice to emotionally condemn them and judge them based upon the lies that we live our own life by. The litmus test is what emotions come up. Why do we struggle with so much anger? Why do we struggle with so much fear and self-condemnation? Guys, it's because we are rejecting the word of God. It's not complicated. It's challenging to let go of those lies, but it's not complicated. Peter admonished Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, to be a workman who can rightly divide the word of God. Guys, there is a right way and there is a wrong way to dividing the word of God. Everything must be taken in context and it must be weighed against his nature. We can't shoehorn what God's word says to fit our own hurts and lies. And it starts with understanding judgments. Deeper communion, if we want it, if we want it, and if we're willing to do what it takes to attain greater intimacy, we have to start with the motive of our heart. We have to redefine what kingdom judgments are, redefine what it means when Father judges. Guys, there's judgments that are going to be poured out. They're poured out on sin, and anyone who does not have the righteousness of Christ comes under the judgment that sin will be judged and burned up by. But Christ satisfied the wrath that was going to come on us. We must begin to transition our thinking if we want intimacy. And Guys, let me read Revelations 12, 10 as we, we close this out. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Guys, this is why we say Satan is the accuser of the brother, because that's all he does. Day and night he accuses God's creation before God. Guys, when we do not see people or ourselves the way the Lord does, we will not judge an action based on righteousness. We will not be judging the action. We will judge the people. When we do this, we come under the demonic mindset of Satan's kingdom. We partake in the accuser of the brethren. How many times do we hear one another emotionally, angrily judge one another, people, the lost, leaders of our nations? How many times have we cursed the United States 
I don't see anywhere in Scripture where we're allowed to curse the United States in the New Covenant. Nowhere, guys. If you have one, please email me. And I would love to sit down and go over it in context. But we continue to do it because we're rejecting our identity. We're rejecting that Father God's heart is toward intimacy and reconciliation. Sin will be judged, a final judgment one day. And in the weeks to come, we're going to talk about the different judgments that take place and how we've lumped them all into one and how it's made a mess of things because we're not, we're not rightly dividing the Word of God. We're not teaching on it. We're teaching on the coming wrath, not on the commission, not on the fact that judgments are meant to wake people up. Judgments are meant to reveal the goodness of God. Judgments are meant to remove us um, from the things that separate us. Guys, Galatians 6, 8 says, whoever sows to the carnal will reap death. Right? If I am sowing to drugs and alcohol, I'm going to reap what I'm sowing in my body, in my relationships, the fallout that takes place in relationships because of my mindset, my thinking, and my actions. Galatians 6 is talking to born-again believers. It is not talking about salvation. It's talking about the kind of walk that we'll have with God. What kind of intimacy we'll have with God is whether we sow to the kingdom or whether we sow to lies and the demonic mindset. Guys, 1 Samuel 15.23 says, Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. We look them up. Witchcraft and iniquity, it's, it's not pretty. And wherever we think, walk, and ultimately express what we believe, if it's contrary to the heart of God, God doesn't judge us in those areas out of anger. He's trying to set us free. However, in the meantime, we cooperate so much with Satan that we're sowing death in our lives. Remember wonder why there's so much turmoil, unrest in our life? It's because of what we're sowing to. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. We like to look at that in terms of God's wrath. Really, it's, it's <laughs> we're sowing it. It has nothing to do with salvation. We received Christ, and that's about the dynamic of our relationship on this earth walk. When I walk into a house, I could tell usually immediately what the type of atmosphere is in that house. I could tell if the person secretly drinks alcohol. I could tell if the person is an adulterer. I could tell if it's a man of God. What, because, you know, I have these amazing gifts? No, not at all, guys. It's because the more that we tune into the kingdom, the more that we can feel the atmosphere of the kingdom. Jesus says, when you walk into a house, speak peace. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest. If not, your peace will return to you. Guys, that's not an allegory. We are meant to have great intimacy where we're more sensitive to the atmosphere of his throne room and his heart. And from that radiance, we minister to others. But it must start with our own heart. Guys, when we don't do this, at the very least, we allow the accuser to poison our thoughts. Our soul begins to darken. Much of the church has been given over to the accuser of the brethren for decades now. Guys, I'm going to finish up with this. There's a difference between desire and intention. If we were to ask one another, if we had the, the, the blessing and honor of renting a big hall or, or being in a big house, we can all gather together and say, what is the desire of your heart? I think pretty much all of us should say they, they want to feel God's love. They want to know their love. I say, oh, I, I read the scriptures or, David, I read what you, you, you share with the righteousness of Christ and he loves us without fault or blame. I want to feel that. I want to know that more. That's a desire. We all have that desire. Intention is what are we going to do about it. Faith without works is dead. Desire without action means there's no intention of doing anything about it. And he's calling us to greater intimacy. One of the aspects of greater intimacy, guys, is to understand what proper kingdom judgment is. How do we judge according to righteousness? This will, there's no way around it, guys. This will kick up the junk in our heart. This will kick up all sorts of stuff. There's not much when we study the Word of God and we look at it as a mirror that won't do it. That's the purpose of it. 
It's to shake us free. It's to get us to see the lies so that we can shake off the grave clothes. We've already been redeemed. Are we still wearing grave clothes? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. That's finishing that up. And I would like to invite all of us, myself included, into a quick prayer of repentance. Frank, do we have time for that? Yes, bro. Go ahead. We got plenty of time. Heavenly Father, I come before you on behalf of the body of Christ and all that listen, are dialed in, Lord God, listening live or after the fact, that, Lord, you've shown me a sea, an ocean of your children that want to believe they are loved by you. Lord, I just, I ask your blessing, your anointing, your consecration upon them, spirit, soul, and body, that they would grab a hold of them, have the courage to shake off the lies. Father, that we begin seeing things according to your heart and according to love. That the excuses we make in order to survive and anesthetize ourselves from the pain of the hurts and the wounds, Lord God, that you would begin giving us the courage, the grace, the unmerited favor, the anointing of your spirit to grab a hold of your truth. Father, that we would begin to move from desire to intention. And Lord, I repent in any and all ways in where my thinking has agreed with the accuser of the brethren. Mm, Where my frustrations and my hurts and my disappointments have allowed me to partner to accuse your children, Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I thank you for the great end times harvest that you are preparing through your children as we grow to maturity to be the light of the world before you return. In the name of Jesus, the demonic spirits, the darkened teachings tickle our ears, Lord. Oh, Lord, I, in Jesus' name, pray that they would begin to be like dross, that they would hold no interest in our hearts. There would be a deadness to the things that are not of you, that we would begin to pick up and have a hunger and a thirst for you and your truth and to move in your glory, to hear your voice, to feel the reality of your kingdom emanate all around us, flowing from within, that we would know, not in theory, but in relationship, what it feels like to have rivers of life flow from our inner man. But I bless the body of Christ. Thank you for your truth going forth with power. And we make the adjustments knowing that we are unconditionally loved and accepted, that there's no condemnation in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that, David. God bless you. You know, you mentioned something that kind of brought something to my mind right away. Um, You know, many of us walking around in, in grave clothes, you know, and like, you know, Lazarus came forth and, and I, this verse, it's very interesting. It says, and when he was dead, came forth bound, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. Folks, we as believers have a job to do, and that's to also help to loosen and let people go. And when you hold on to anger and refuse to forgive your brothers and and you're not there to support and help or you carry that, whatever it is in your heart, you you keep the grave clothes on those who you who we call brothers and sisters so often. When our job is to help unwrap them, be there to set them free, to be the nurturers in Christ. It's as David's been trying to tell us, it, it's really, it's not about us at all. It's about others. And the joy of learning these truths of what it means to be somebody in Christ means that now you 
can go out and do something about this rotten world. You're not going to change the world, but you can change people by introducing them to Jesus Christ. And then when God begins to change their heart, and you watch that person go from that old person, filthy individual that didn't care, to that born-again believer, I don't know what else to say, but it is the only... Honestly, this is the reason why we live, is to share Christ with others. Loosen your brethren from the grave clothes, the grave cloth of this world. David, that it's so true what you said this evening. And we definitely need to play a part in this and getting busy about saving souls. I just want to say thanks for what you've shared tonight. It's been a lot. Amen, on and Frank as always. Thank you, Frank. And, and and for those of you listening, just to what Frank's saying in his heart, and I just want to encourage you, what I hear coming from many of your hearts is what's wrong with me. I just don't care that much. And that's okay, guys. It's okay. The reason why we don't have that passion is because we don't yet know how much he loves us. We can only give what we possess. What he's doing in this hour is he's setting an invitation. He's setting a table for us to heal and to come into great intimacy. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And guys, as we continue to step out, as we continue to allow him to transform us, our eyes are going to start to open up. We're going to start to see people that we didn't see before. We're going to start to look at strangers that we didn't look at before. It's just going to start little by little. What will happen is you'll begin to notice that your thinking is changing little by little. And you may be more inclined to do something for a stranger or for someone else that's hurting. That in the past you've judged more harshly, your heart's going to begin to soften. And that's a litmus that God is slowly changing your belief system. You're not going to be perfect. None of us are. But that will grow. Feed the fire. Sometimes we have to exercise love and patience when we don't feel it. That's the process of transformation. It's okay. Get to know who you are. Find out what it means to be a son and daughter of the living God. Find out what it means to be fully pleasing and without spot or blemish. There's no turning back. You'll never look back. So, Frank, thank you. Always an honor, always a blessing, and thank you for having me on tonight. God bless you and your family, brother. I appreciate it. Um, looking forward to the next part, and folks, please, you know, share this with your friends. I mean, it's so important to get free from the bondage of of this world of living up to people, living up to other people's expectations finding your value in someone else, you've got to shake that off. When you find your value in Christ, it is a life-changing experience. And He is here to help you do that which you cannot do. Boy, and then the moment you start to believe what He's actually said about you, oh, living holy will become a lot easier. Because as David said, you will begin to receive And when you receive, then you can finally share because it'll be in you. And it starts with receiving. You know, it's interesting. The Bible says, my peace have I given you. And so often we say, Lord, Lord, I need your peace. And he's saying, I've already given it to you. I've had to slow myself down, Dave, and say, Lord, help me to receive it. (laughs) I'm having trouble receiving what you've given me. I keep asking for a gift that you've already given. So. Anyways, God bless you, man, brother. We're looking forward to having you back soon. Folks, this is Brother Frank with the Remnant Call and Brother David Murray saying to everybody, good night, God bless, and shalom.